Well, welcome. My name is Michelle Colopy, and I am the executive director for Lead for Pollinators. We are a nonprofit organization here in Akron, Ohio, and we work across the United States to educate uh, beekeepers and others who are concerned about the health and safety of the ecosystem. So thank you very much for having me talk with your science teacher, Ms. Ruth Roop, and good luck with your poster contest that you, the class is all participating in. Today I'm going to give you some more information about being keepers of the ecosystem because we are all keepers of this ecosystem. 4,000 native pollinator species across North America, so not just in the United States. We share our native pollinators with Canada and with Mexico. Many of our pollinators, like the monarchs, winter uh, in uh, woods in forested areas in Mexico. So many of these pollinator species are, of course, they are native bees like the carter bee or the bumblebee. Typically, the first name of a bee tells you something about that bee. The carter bee obviously weaves uh, a, a nest for itself. The bumblebee, as we all know, kind of bumbles along. And I think we all have heard that um, basically a bumblebee probably shouldn't be able to fly based on its size, but it does. We have carpenter bees, which look like bumblebees, but they are not. Carpenter bees have a uh, solid uh, black behind. Uh, bumblebees have uh, yellow and black stripes, but there's a carpenter bee. We've got swallowtail butterflies. We have skippers and sulfurs, which are smaller uh, butterfly, uh, sometimes close to the moth. And then we have bats who are pollinators, we have moths, big and small, and we have birds, whether it is the honey creeper out in Hawaii or the hummingbird that is across the United States. These are also pollinators we have that pollinate our flowers and certainly our food. Food is made possible by our pollinators. Our native pollinators are quite connected with our native plants like squashes, tomatoes, blueberries, bell peppers, cantaloupes. Those are native to the Americas. The other uh, plants like watermelons, peaches, apples, soybeans, those came from Europe. So honeybees are used to those plants, but not necessarily our native bees. So we need all of our diversity in our pollinators to support the diversity of plant life that we have. Now, honeybees are immigrants from Europe. They came over with the pilgrims. So they do not necessarily like all of our native plants, which is again why we still need to have our native pollinators. Honeybees pollinate many of our crops. They um, pollinate the old world foods because that's what they were used to over in Europe and Asia. And they certainly help us provide the one in three bites of food because they are pollinating our fruits, nuts, vegetables, and seed crops. And without those honeybees and our native bees, we would not have our delicious, nutritious diet. There are three different types of beekeepers. There are backyard beekeepers um, on the left of your screen there. That is actually one of my hives in my backyard. And um, then you have Sideliner beekeepers in the middle, they may have up to a thousand hives. And then you have commercial beekeepers who move their beehives. And you can see the gentleman there loading with a forklift hives, beehives, usually about four high, five high, um, with four hives on each pallet. And they drive them across the country to pollinate the mono crops that we have in this country. Mono agriculture is not sustainable beekeeping, but migratory beekeeping began after World War II when agriculture changed and we started to have thousands of acres of one crop which by doing that it's a smorgasbord for the pests because you have thousands of acres of one thing the pests love to chew on. But then if that crop needs pollinated you have to truck in the bees to just pollinate that crop when it is in bloom. And then you have to truck those bees out when the bloom is done. Otherwise, the bees would starve to death. There is nothing else for those bees to eat in a monoculture system. So be bees, the real world of our bees, they are impacted by so many things. But it does, you can narrow it down to the four Ps. Pesticide exposure, poor forage, 
pests and pathogens. And certainly the, the little ugly looking bug in the middle there, that's called a varroa mite. That is a pest impacting bees and it, um, it acts like a, a flea on your dog so that it uh, sucks the blood of the animal and uh, of, of the bee and it spreads diseases. <clears throat> You have uh, pathogens. Every creature has pathogens that want to uh, harm it. Um, you have the weather that will impact bees. If you have too early of a spring and then a late snowstorm, that could very well uh, kill bees by freezing them to death because they weren't prepared for a, a late season snowstorm. But we have pesticide exposure of pesticides being applied directly to crops that are in bloom or those pesticides drifting onto plants that are in bloom, like even the cornfield that is being planted. Corn seeds and Soybean seeds typically have pesticides coated on them, and as they are planted, those pesticides chip off, then get caught up in the dust of the planter, blow on the wind, and if those uh, that dust laced with pesticide lands on flowers that are in bloom, it has just made those flowers toxic and will kill bees. That last picture down in the lower right is a grassy field, which is just a desert for bees. It offers no food source whatsoever. Bees do not eat grass. They need flowers, they need pollen and nectar for food sources. This is what our farmland looks like today. This is actually a picture outside of Dayton, Ohio in southwest Ohio. And we have basically tried to put little oasis out there for birds, for frogs, for turtles, for, for tree toads, for bees, for pollinators. And even these little oases are not connected to each other. So this is an unhealthy, unsustainable farming system. It is not a, a healthy system for our pollinators and our other wildlife and even for birds. This is a healthy farming system. Regenerative agriculture is the new movement where we, in a sense, return to what our great grandfathers used to do when they farmed. They had cover crops where they just um, grew flowering plants to help rejuvenate the soil and they would sometimes then plow in that uh, that cover crop when it had um, come to its the end of its life so it would provide nutrients into the soil you have pastures you're rotating animals through the crop fields through the pastures so that you can give the soil some relief from constantly growing something we have field borders to help provide food sources for pollinators you have stream buffers to protect from soil erosion from the fields uh, polluting the streams you can see that the wooded areas are all connected in some way so that the wildlife the native pollinators uh, the, the animals, the birds, can traverse that area safely and expand their territory and have plentiful food sources. This is how we can have healthy pollinators on working farmland. You can see in this map, this is where we have in this country used glyphosate, which is a weed killer because we have far too many people. And I'm sure you hear this about your, maybe your parents out in your front or backyard. Oh, there's a weed out there. We've got to go out and kill it. It's probably a wildflower. If it's a dandelion, that's the first food source for every pollinator. Please let those dandelions flower. Please let them grow because that is a first food source for pollinators. And also if you want to learn at home about um, dandelion greens, you can actually eat dandelion leaves and put them in your salad. Uh, people also make dandelion wine. So there are many things we can do with dandelions because pollinators are helping to pollinate them and it's a gorgeous food source. It's a wonderful food source for them. Please allow those pollinators to have that first spring food source of dandelions. But when we look at where we're using glyphosate, you will see by the next chart with monarch's migration route, this is why the monarch butterfly has decreased so severely in this country. The monarchs winter in Mexico and it takes four to five generations to go up to Canada and to go back to their wintering grounds. So they have to have food sources and habitat along the migratory route in order to support the young, the, the uh, caterpillars in a sense that they are, those butterflies are leaving behind to grow into butterflies so that we continue the population of the monarchs. But you can see where glyphosate has been used 
and why the habitat has been lost for the monarchs on their migration route. Had we only called milkweed monarchs delight, people would probably appreciate milkweed a lot better. But we, we can change how we use and how we treat weeds and start calling them wildflowers because they are there for a reason and they are there to support another life. They are there to support pollinators. And pollinators support the plants and the plants help to support. You can see this uh, um, black swallowtail on butterfly weed. There's swamp milkweed. They're pretty pretty flowers. They do certainly when milkweed goes to seed it makes this pod and the seeds are on these little white fluffy um, uh, carriers in a sense. They blow on the wind to spread their seed. So let these plants go to seed. Let them feed the, the butterflies and the bees because they desperately need this food source. You can see there was a study done on that monarch migration route and of the western monarch butterflies. They found that for every 160 monarchs 30 years ago there's only one left flying today. And it is due to the loss of habitat. The loss of habitat of cutting down these plants and using pesticides, herbicides, to destroy milkweed and swamp uh, milkweed and all of these other plants that support butterflies that last year there was an 86% decline. We can save the monarch, but we have to provide them their food and their habitat. Because in the end, less than 5% of the world's insects are harmful to humans and crops. I realize insects don't look pretty to us. And that, you know, you can have a, a, an insect run across the floor and it will make the biggest football player scream like a three-year-old girl. But we need our insects. They are there to eat other insects, they are food for other creatures, and they are helping to pollinate our plants, they're helping to aerate our soil. Again, less than 5% of the world's insects are harmful to us or to crops. So learn to like insects. Learn to love insects because they are making our lives healthier. They are providing us with food that is delicious and tasty and nutritious for us. We know the pesticides are toxic to honeybees and other pollinators. You can go and, uh, on the internet and do a search for lists of uh, toxic pesticides to honeybees. This is one from Purdue University Extension. You can decide labels, but not all labels will tell you if it's harmful to bees. If you're trying to kill a soft, squishy insect, you will kill a bee because bees are soft, squishy insects. If you're trying to kill a chewing sucking soft squishy insect you will kill a pollinator because they are soft and squishy and they are chewing sucking insects because that is how they uh, get the nectar out of the plant they have a long tongue that they suck up that nectar they take the pollen off of flowers to spread the pollen to other plants but they also take that pollen back to their hives and they chew it up and they make something called bee bread and they feed that pollen in this bee bread which is a mix of pollen and honey and they feed it to the next generation of bees. So you have to read any pesticide label before buying it and using it please to protect yourself, your family, your pets, your neighbors. Understand that pesticides include insecticides, herbicides, and fungicides. And you want to let those beneficial insects live to feed on pests first and foremost. So if you see some pests on a plant in your backyard, one, make sure it's a pest. Two, wait 24 to 48 hours because the beneficial insects will realize there's food there and they will come in and take care of them. They will eat them. They will lay a, an egg on it that will become a parasite on that pest, which will eat that pest. Or if you just have one plant in your garden that is really being beaten up by the pests, then that plant is weak and you need to pull it out so that it doesn't infect the other plants. Because there are plants that are also not strong, not healthy, which then the pests realize that and they take advantage of it. But don't just always think, let's spray on a pesticide. Let those beneficial insects live so they can feed on the pests. Reduce that pesticide exposure. Do not use pesticides on any plant that's in bloom because you will make the pollen and the nectar of that plant toxic for the very pollinators you want to pollinate your, your backyard garden or your flowers. 
You want to make sure you protect the waters that pollinators drink. The, you will often see bees around your bird bath or at the edge of your swimming pool. They don't want you. They just want water. So, you know, put out and make sure there there is clean water for them. If for some reason you have sprayed, whether it's you're washing the side of your house or your car and you've sprayed some chemical in the air, dump that bird bath water so that there's no residual of that pesticide or that car wash soap or anything that's sitting as a film on top of that bird bath water. Because anything you spray does not necessarily go where you want it to. I'm sure you've all sprayed something and you realized, uh-oh, it all blew back in my face because the wind just blew it back in your face. That's drift of any aerosol type product. So protect and reduce pesticide drift because the stuff moves through the air, it moves through the soil and the water, any pesticides that you are using. Even again, pesticides, fertilizers used on your front yard drift. They will run off the yard, they will go into the sewers and the streams and eventually Lake Erie. You want to protect yourself, your family, your pets, your neighbors, so please read those labels before buying and using it. There is a symbol on some insecticides, insecticides only, that is supposed to warn you that it is toxic to bees. So this little symbol, this diamond shaped symbol with a bee in it is supposed to tell you not to use that product when bees are foraging or on plants that the bees will forage because it is toxic to bees. So look for that symbol on insecticides only. Now pesticides do have a half-life. Hopefully you've learned that in um, one of your science classes. Certainly if you get to chemistry later in high school, they will talk about the half-life that it takes for a chemical to degrade. Chemicals degrade by being exposed to sunlight uh, and sometimes just by time. Most of them uh, UV light will break them down, but not completely. Glyphosate, an herbicide, can last 47 to 174 days in the soil. So from one application, it continues to kill. And you can see from insecticides, many of these are used to control for mosquitoes and for other chewing, sucking insects. But you can see they can last from anywhere from a few hours to up to five years in the soil or in the water. That from one application, those pesticides continue to kill. So be aware of what you're doing and why. Why are you using a pesticide? Do you really need to use it? What else will you kill that you don't want to kill by using that pesticide? Understand that these chemicals are synthetic chemicals, that um, they have a half-life longer than uh, organic products. Organic meaning soap and water if you have say some gnats or little um, spiders on your plants, your house plants, you just need to get out a, a small tub of uh, soapy water and take a sponge and wash off the leaves on your plant and that will take care of those little white spiders. Soapy water. So these systemic pesticides are have become a big problem because they get into the soil uh, of any plant uh, around that plant and the, the plant picks up that systemic pesticide into its vascular system and exudes that pesticide through the pollen and nectar, making that food instantly toxic to pollinators. And you can see this one, uh, the neonics, neonicotinoids, while they mimic uh, nicotine, it is a synthetic and what it does is it makes the insect spasm itself to death. It just has contractions after contractions in, in its muscles until it dies. This is what these neonicotinoids, neonics for short, uh, will do to a soft, squishy, chewing, sucking insect like pollinators. And you can see the half-life of these products up to 997 days, up to almost, what is it, 1100 days? This is the half-life. So it's continuing to kill across that time frame. And these neonics you will find on pesticide labels. It will not say it's a neonicotinoid because that's a class of pesticide. It will have its active ingredient name like clothianidin, dinotefrin, amidacloprid, diamethoxin, ditinpyrum, 
niathiazine, thiacloprid, acetamiprid, sofoxiflor, flupyridifurone, or fipronil. Those are the active ingredients in the class of pesticides called neonics or neonicotinoids, which are, high, are systemic and highly toxic to honeybees. You will kill them. Water may contain these pesticides due to drift and even flooding issues. We've had a lot of rain the last couple of days. The Cuyahoga River has been quite full. And if it floods farmland where corn or soybean seeds have been planted, the pesticides on those that are coated onto those seeds will then run off into the streams and rivers. And we now have a year round presence of neonics in the tributaries to the Great Lakes. And these pesticides in our Great Lakes are contributing to the algae blooms. They are contributing then to toxic water for the wildlife in the water, as well as those cities on uh, the edge of Lake Erie that use Lake Erie water for their freshwater supply. These are the things that we can do to help reduce the exposure of pesticides to our pollinators and to us. We have to understand that as we do things around our house, that we are also contributing to lawn chemical use and other pesticides going into the, the soil, into the air, and into the streams and rivers. And that on average, home gardeners are actually using more fertilizer and pesticides than farmers do. So it is not just one part of agriculture. It is all of us as humans in the way that we interact with our land. We are not appreciating insects. Uh, we are not valuing our water. We need to protect the water, the air, the soil in order to protect our pollinators and the very food that they give us, those one in three bites of food that they give us. When we talk about planting uh, for pollinators, you want to plant for native plants. You can see from this chart that turf or lawn grass, it barely goes down three inches. The root system of grass is so shallow. This is why we have puddles of water and our sidewalks because the water after a rainstorm just runs right off the yard. There isn't enough there to help hold that water in. Native plants, look at them, the root system of these native plants can sometimes go down 15 feet in your yard. So that this is why you wouldn't, you don't have to water native plants. They are used to droughts, they're used to a lot of water. They can adjust because they have such a strong, vital root system. Turf grass, eh, 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 it barely goes down a couple of inches. Native plants, native plants is what you want. When our honeybees, when our bumblebees, when our carter bees, our mason bees, our sweat bees are experiencing the ecosystem, this is their environment. This is their environment of everything drifting, of things moving through the ecosystem. Because just because you spray a pesticide or you um, even paint your deck, there are still fumes that leave from the paint that you're using. There is maybe some runoff from the paint because you drip it and then it goes into the soil and then it spreads through the soil. Nothing stays in one place. So that our honeybees and our native pollinators are affected by pesticides through drift and dust and seed coatings of pesticides on seeds, by the systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids, by pesticide residues still sitting on leaves, so that even if a plant isn't in bloom, after a rainstorm a bee may sit on a leaf, but then they might be sitting on pesticides on that leaf and they pick up those residues and they take those residues back to the hive where they can kill the hive. So we want to plant pesticide-free pollinator forage so that we have cleaner water, so that we have healthier pollinators, so we are providing food for our pollinators. We all like to go up to Lake Erie. Some uh, folks love to fish in Lake Erie. You like to fish in the Cuyahoga River, to go canoeing on the Cuyahoga River or kayaking, but we want to have a healthy water system so that we can enjoy it. The fish are healthy, the pollinators are healthy because they may go to those streams or rivers at the edge to get fresh water. Because a beehive needs, a, a beehive in the summer needs a gallon and a half of water on a hot day because they will, they have bees, worker bees that will actually go collect water, bring it back to the hive, and then they fan their wings over the water they deposit in the hive to evaporate it and help cool the hive.
So they're not just drinking it to drink water like we do because we're thirsty. They are taking that water back to the hive to help cool the hive. Because they can keep a beehive at a standard temperature in the, in the high 80s to keep it comf comfortable for them. It's humid, it's, it's warm, and it's a stable temperature. But they use water to help cool their hives. So we can help pollinators. You can be, uh, go to the link of iNaturalist, add that app to your uh, cell phone, to your iPad, uh, to your, um, uh, any, your laptop, and get to love insects. Learn about insects, the plants they interact with, and you can be part of the Citizens Naturalist, where you can help keep track of insects in your neck of the woods. You can be part of uh, crowdsourcing identifications. You can learn about nature, but you can be that citizen scientist. Right now, the rusty patch bumblebee is on the endangered species list. There have only been four sightings in different places in Ohio. You can be part of that as the bumblebees are emerging in the next uh, about six, eight weeks. You can go out in your yard, start to look at your flowers, and start to take, you can take pictures through iNaturalist, upload it through the app to identify it, um, find out what kind of bee it is, and get yourself on the map as a citizen scientist, helping to locate these rusty patch bumblebees so that we can plant more habitat around them, we can help support them, and we can uh, tell others, yes, Ohio is doing its part to help these endangered species. Help track that rusty path in your, back, in, in your backyard. You can certainly uh, support organic growers, small farmers who are doing the right thing about sustainable agriculture, who are working on their working lands to protect pollinators and provide uh, good health pollinators and birds and all the other creatures that really help support farming. They really help support farming by protecting those farmlands from pests. You can go to YouTube and watch a 30-minute uh, documentary about the Keep the Hives Alive tour. I was part of that a couple of years ago, and we followed uh, a beekeeper across the country as he reached out and spoke to different folks um, from Nebraska clear down to Washington, D.C., who were beekeepers, who were farmers, and the changes they were making towards sustainable agriculture to help solve the bee crisis and to keep our hives alive. Certainly you want to understand mosquitoes and pollinators. They're both soft, squishy, chewing, sucking insects, but there are about 174 species of mosquitoes in North America, and yet we have nearly 4,000 pollinators. So while we do not want mosquitoes spreading disease, mosquitoes are still there for a purpose. There are some mosquitoes who are pollinators, but mosquitoes also are food for birds and frogs and toads and salamanders and so many other creatures. They are a food source. As humans have to understand that if we want to protect ourselves from the diseases that some mosquitoes spread, not all mosquitoes spread disease. Uh, I know in our city in Akron, they trap and test mosquitoes. They only spray for mosquitoes if they find a trapped mosquito that has a disease. Otherwise, guess what? It's summer. We have mosquitoes. You can take your own personal um, actions to protect yourself from mosquitoes by applying a mosquito repellent uh, as, and also understanding how to use mosquito sprays. Far too many people will try to market to you Let's spray your backyard and they do it every week. That is not addressing the mosquito issue because they're just killing pollinators. Mosquito spray, when you spray it every week, is just building up resistance in the mosquitoes and eventually we'll have too many of the disease carrying mosquitoes who are resistant to products like uh, this one. The active ingredient is Nalid. But you must understand when you spray for mosquitoes, you're going to kill pollinators because this chemical also kills soft, squishy, chewing, sucking insects like pollinators. You want to control for mosquitoes in your own backyard, your own front yard, your neighborhood. Get rid of mosquito habitat. There's a wonderful brochure that's actually um, available at mosquito.org. You can print that, share it with your family, so that your siblings, your parents are all involved in making sure you're not breeding mosquitoes. A cup of water holds a thousand mosquito eggs.
a cup of water. So when you leave toys outside and they fill with water, mosquitoes lay their eggs really fast. A bird bath that you're not dumping the water every day and putting in fresh water can breed mosquitoes. Pool covers, hot tub covers, your gutters on your house that don't drain well, uh, saucers under potted plants. These all hold water and can breed mosquitoes. So keep in mind if you're being bitten by a lot of mosquitoes, they feed within 300 feet of their breeding site. So it's you and your neighbors breeding them. So you need to work to eliminate mosquito breeding sites. Spraying does not eliminate the breeding site. You as humans, we have to get rid of standing water. You can certainly, if you do have pests in your backyard garden, there are organic solutions. If you have some weeds, some thistles, or some other weeds that are um, very dangerous based on you, know, you playing in your backyard, some weeds have a lot of uh, uh, prickers on them or, or stickers, there are organic weed solutions. This one just uses a, a, a citrus-based oil to uh, damage or kill the weed. But you want to support your beneficial insects, those praying mantises, the ladybugs, the um, aphid parasites, which are typically little wasps that will lay their eggs on uh, aphids, uh, killing them. So support those beneficial insects. Don't just go to the hardware store and get some chemical. Read the labels. Understand the implications of spray that could damage pollinators or could damage the very food the pollinators may want to eat because you need to plant pesticide-free pollinator forage so the bees have something to eat from spring through fall. And there's this wonderful uh, resource at Honeybee Net uh, from NASA. And if you just click on the, uh, in our neck of the woods, the darker green area, and that will come up with a list of trees and shrubs and flowers you can plant to support pollinators across the entire growing season. Bees, especially honeybees, all pollinators need food across the spring, summer, and fall. So we've got to have something blooming during those times. And certainly if you're going to buy plants at one of the retail stores, be aware that plants coming from out of state by law have to have pesticides sprayed on them and many of times those pesticides are the neonicotinoids so you would just be planting a killing field. It is really plant from seed. And there's a wonderful company, a seed uh, company over in Hiram that has some wonderful seeds, pollinator packets. They have uh, birds and butterflies. They have them for a fall fuel for pollinators. Uh, so it's just fall blooming plants. They have quick growing wildflowers. They have wildflowers for wet areas. If you've got a wet area in your yard, they have a wonderful array of seed packets that you can get at Ohio Prairie Nursery or OPN's OPN seed as they call themselves now but look on their website and look at the different seed mixes they have you can still plant your seeds for flowers that will bloom this year it's a wonderful mixes of annuals and perennials and remember that annuals reseed themselves so you can plant this year and that planting will reseed itself. You don't have to buy seeds every year. You don't have to put in the plants every year. If you plant from seeds, the perennials will grow down first, making the roots. The annuals will grow up so that they can make flowers, so that the pollinators will pollinate them, so those flowers will turn into seeds. Those seeds will drop into the soil for next year's growth. Seeds, it's the best way to plant for pollinators. Certainly, again, get those native plants have those native flower seeds and that's certainly what Ohio Prairie Nursery provides because the root system is so much deeper it's healthier you don't need to water so that you're conserving water by planting native plants and you're supporting native pollinators by planting native plants you are creating healthier soil by planting native plants with that strong diverse um, and broad root system so it's a healthier yard that will hold on to that rainwater. You'll have less puddling around your sidewalks or your driveway by planting native plants. 
is my front yard that I planted in native plants with seeds from Ohio Prairie Nursery. And my front yard actually goes, has transitions across the season. I might start out with a lot of yellow and white in the spring, which then goes to purple and a deep orange by midsummer, and then goes into the more of the fall colors, a lot of rich dark yellows, uh, the golden rods and the echinacea, the purple cone flower. And it's just a wonderful array of food that is constantly growing across the growing season. So I have my yard blooms from spring through fall. So I always have food for my pollinators. So all of us can be keepers of the ecosystem and you can make that difference in the lives of pollinators. So reduce or stop your pesticide and lawn chemical use. Read all pesticide labels. It is the law to read the label. If you misuse, if you use a product, even per the directions, it's all on your responsibility. Um, the manufacturer is not liable for anything. Part of the label says that. So read pesticide labels before you spend the money. Plant pollinator forage. Plant flowers that pollinators want. Plant native plants. Educate your friends about pollinators and how they give us one in three bites of food that without our pollinators we would not have fruits, nuts, vegetables, or seeds. Buy local honey from local beekeepers. Support your local farmers, your community supported agriculture like Crown Point Ecology Center, your farmers markets, or those stores that get food from local farms. Educate your neighbors about why you're not using lawn chemicals anymore. Educate your neighbors about why you're putting in pollinator habitat, that it's healthier for our community. It's conserving stormwater runoff, which helps the health of the Cuyahoga River and even Lake Erie. This is why we're planting pollinator habitat. It's not just for pollinators. It is for all of us and for the water. Educate your local leaders that we need to have more pollinator habitat around the cities, that when a tree falls down on the tree lawn, that the city should put in a pollinator attractive or a pollinator supportive tree. Remove mosquito habitat. So get rid of standing water. Chemicals will not solve the problem with mosquitoes. We need to eradicate mosquito habitat around our homes so that we stay healthy and safe from any diseases from those mosquitoes but remove the mosquito habitat that's standing water. Plant those native plants, certainly buy local plants from the local nurseries. Make sure it's a locally raised plant that doesn't uh, have soil that's saturated in pesticides. And support organic farmers and organic growers and organic nurseries. Most importantly, appreciate insects. They do so much for us. Yes, they might not look the best, but they don't think we're that attractive. So appreciate insects. They do so much for us, giving us food, aerating our soil, providing us with healthy plants, providing us with the diversity of plant life that we have, the flowers, the trees. It's a beautiful environment in which we live, but it takes those insects to make it happen. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. Good luck with your poster contest. And I'd like to thank your science teacher, Miss Ruth Roop, for contacting me. You can find out more information about our organization at leadforpollinators.org or at our Facebook page. If anyone has any questions, additional questions, feel free to email me at the email address there below, E-X-E-C-D-I-R, at leadforpollinators.org. I'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.